Welcome to Creative Podcast, episode 50-something. My friend Matt Bell here. Uh, Matt Bell, first of all, is getting his master's in electric violin. Yes, that's a thing. Uh, second of all, he works here at the Electric Violin Shop. Uh, electric Violin Shop is a sponsor, but Matt Bell is a human as well. He's also my friend. I've known him for many years. Uh, we got a wall of electric violins here, but just to be clear, I like the Yamaha electric violin, all right? Um, but we're going to talk about uh, tone audits. Tone audits, like you know, you just your, you know, you hate your tone, and you want to figure out how do I get a good tone. Uh, Matt Bell can help you. He does tone audits. We're gonna look at my tone. I don't think I did. Well, he actually, you have given me some good advice already to demo <laughs> my tone. So I, you know, I tend to think I kind of know the stuff, but you know, he's got some good ideas, and we're gonna ping back and forth about some of the most frequent questions you have about gear, and um, probably get some philosophy too. We'll probably play some, get Matt's take on some things. Did I get that right? Anything I missed? Nailed it. First all right. take. All right. So, <laughs> yeah, this is all going to be first take. Just to be clear, that's how I roll, you know. But you can check out uh, Electric Violin Shop's uh, shorts on YouTube and their TikToks. Because, Matt, is you're amazing, man, with the edits. We were talking about that before. We're in Durham, North Carolina. Electric Violin Shop, first of all, I always tell people, you got any question about um, electric violins, uh, pickups, mics, amps effects you know and the things that you don't know that you don't know about whatever it is you're just like i want to be loud i want to make sounds you know this is what i tell everybody just call electric violin shop call them and we're actually here we, like, eli's here chris is here susie's here it's a collectively uh own employee yeah it's owned. a worker own co-op so the inmates are truly running the asylum yeah yeah so and that's just really awesome yeah. and and it, i did some clinics yesterday in durham um with lasandra booth dr mm, lasandra yeah. booth um it's actually in rollsville they have this beautiful community youth orchestra program and she's amazing and i was also at unc uh greensboro with dr rebecca mcleod who's the incoming president of american string teachers association um so i took a couple extra days i wanted to spend, i'm going to be at durham school of the arts on friday but oh, i wanted yeah. to spend some time with you so um first of all um let's let's just talk about some of the the big gear questions that people have if that's okay with you sure. um and you can just you can ax any of these uh what are the mistakes people make around gear what are the top three things people need to know about gear how much does it cost the most necessary things that people need what do you think about any of that yeah i think the first thing about gear is just don't be intimidated by this stuff like guitar players can figure it out if guitar players can figure it out we can figure it out right so um yeah don't be intimidated by the stuff there's you're not gonna hurt anything by experimenting like people, I don't know, can I plug this into that? Yeah, man, plug it in. Like the worst case scenario is you're gonna hear it and go, yeah, I, that's not a sound that I need, right? Or maybe you're gonna turn a knob and the guy who taught me most of what I learned about sound early in my, in my sound engineering career, he was getting frustrated because I'm asking questions. What about this knob? What about that knob? And he's, hey man, it's a knob, turn it. If it sounds worse, turn it the other way. And it sounded like, at first it's a little trite, but you go, well, I mean, he's not wrong. So it's a knob, man. Turn it. If it sounds worse, turn it the other way. I love that. And, and just because we're such good friends, I'm just going to give you the hard counterpoint. I don't have time for that garbage, man. I don't want to mess with it. You know, he's like, you're talking to me about TikTok edits. Like, I know. I'm not going to do it, man. Power to you. Respect to you for it. So, like, um, so like, I sometimes want to go to some to like you and be like, is this right or is it wrong? Like, what's the easiest way for me to get to a good sound? So can I ask you a couple pointed questions yeah. about that? Okay, so solid body versus acoustic with a pickup mm -hmm. versus microphone. Yeah, you know uh, that's that's a big one, right? Is like, sure. do I need to buy an electric, you know, solid body? Get the Yamaha if you do, or you know, or should I get a pickup on my violin? Or should I use a mic? What do you think about that? Yeah, so I, I actually have an engineering degree. My undergrad's in engineering. And the day one of engineering school, they teach you the answer to every question is, it depends. So the answer is solid body, uh, uh, electric, or you know, acoustic with a pickup or acoustic with a mic. The answer is, it depends. What are you trying to do with it? So every application is different. The reason that there are different instruments is it's like the same reason there's a minivan and a sports car and a pickup. Like, what's the best car for me? I don't know. What do you do with it? You hauling rocks? Are you racing people? Are you running kids to school? So 
a, generally, so the most natural sound, the thing that's going to sound most like your acoustic under your ear is going to be acoustic with a mic on it. Right? Acoustic with a good mic, a DPA mic or a cloud vocal mic, a bunch of these nice mics. That's going to be the most natural violin-y acoustic sound. So why doesn't everybody use that? Well, feedback and isolation. So if I'm on stage next to a drummer feedback, whose right. hands are coming up over his head every time he hits the drums, that microphone can hear my violin, but it can also hear his drums. Right. So sound engineer tries to turn me up. All he gets is a bunch of cymbals. Yeah. So and loud. Then, so and if it's feedback. loud sound, so if you're playing in a loud sound environment, the mic's not going to work for you. Right. Basically, if there's drums next to you, you know, if it's a metal band, the mic is not going to be a good solution. But if right. you're just playing by yourself in a quiet room, it could be really nice. Use a mic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And but also, and and sorry, this is a little bit of a tangent, but with a loop pedal, I know that vocalists use microphones. Sure. But if you try to use a mic with like your instrument into a loop pedal, it's a little hairier, right? Or yeah, or, for sure. Okay. Yeah. And it's and it's also because that mic can hear your violin. It can also hear you. Breathing. It can hear the pedal. Yeah. When you click the pedal, it's going to hear that click. It's going to hear breathing. You got a baby in the front row going, eh. no. who wants to hear that 38 yeah. times in a row? And if you're speak, back. Yeah, then you're speaking into the mic, then you can hold it right in your mouth. But right. if you're trying to put the instrument that close, it's hard to do. Right. That's part of why, right? Um, okay, so so solid body instrument then, this is great for like the loudest sound environments, right? right. Because you're not going to get feedback. It's going to minimize the chance of getting that screeching sound and you can right. get total separation. Um, here's my question though. Do you get better uh process like better effects with this versus a good pickup yeah so that's a good question on in a on an acoustic with a pickup you actually get a more complex sound right you get all this woodiness of the body and there's in the back of that instrument is going to be a little bit microphonic right this is basically a big microphone diaphragm um whoa so well it's essentially a speaker because the violin flexes, but a speaker, when exposed to high volume levels, switches and becomes microphonic. So if you're in front of a loud, if you're in front of a loud monitor, the back of this will actually become microphonic, and you're it's a more complex, less isolated sound. So it depends on what effects you're using. If you're using distortion, distortion really likes having a very clean input because if you start adding all this other stuff and all this complexity with it the distortion can start getting pretty muddy that's yeah. distortion sorry man i'm just you know yeah. just, we're, we're friends i'm just gonna interrupt you <laughs> i'll apologize later so man you're blowing my mind i didn't even know you were an engineer so yeah that's really cool <laughs> I always I always glaze out when people start giving me the the engineering it, but I appreciate it, and I'm sure some of you do too. Uh, but wow, it depends on the effect. Yeah, it, it depends on the application, depends on the effect. Yeah, and that's why there are so many different instruments because each one of them is sort of a little bit different. You'll never meet a guitar player, a professional guitar player, who has one guitar. Yeah, right. they've all got 20 and you're like why well because they're all different yeah and i have and, and the way i roll is i have a double violin case and i take both of these everywhere i go and and so my um my uh violin um my acoustic violin i use a pickup which is a yamaha pickup mm -hmm. but they don't make these anymore and so the best pickups so first of all we talked about the mic we talked about solid body let's talk about pickups for a yeah. second you know um best pickups and price ranges um because i think for a lot of people like let's say you have an acoustic violin and you don't want to invest or take a second you know solid body then you may want to put a pickup on your instrument right mm -hmm. um actually here's a myth or a question is it a myth is it true putting a pickup on your acoustic violin is it going to ruin it uh, I have a I have a nice acoustic from uh, the late 1800s, and I have had pickups on it, and I have not had pickups on it, and it has not ruined the instrument. Right. Um, so again, the question on pickups: What's the best kind of pickup? It depends. It depends on what you're trying to do. So if you occasionally amplify your violin, say I'm usually playing in the local symphony orchestra, but I'm picking up a wedding gig this weekend, then I need to amplify the violin you're going to want a removable pickup or a removable mic. Um, and there are a number of different ones of those. They're all, they kind of have some different features. Um, 
price point you're looking between a hundred and six hundred dollars kind of depending on oh, really? what you want to do the removable pickup i because back in the day i thought it was like they were only cheap but now it sounds like they have uh, better versions you of can get some really good removable pickups or oh. or mics there are okay. there are some where it could be a pickup or a mic blend. it's actually a dual two. it's a dual transmitter and it's wireless so it's a built-in wireless thing you got a little clamp clamps on the side of your instrument it could be a mic or a pickup so you can get to the gig and make a game time decision am i going to use a mic or a pickup Ooh. so that's pretty nice wow if now, you amplify your violin all the time like you do you're going to do a replacement bridge and there are a couple different ones um they some are a little brighter some are a little darker and it's going to depend on what if you've got a dark instrument you might want a brighter pickup on it if you've got a really bright instrument you might want a darker pickup on it and it's going to depend a little bit kind of on your tone preference am i playing solo am i playing in a band if i'm playing in a band and i'm trying to compete with guitar players i might want something a little brighter if i'm doing more solo stuff and i need like this rich uh fat sound i might want something darker it's again it depends so my violin has this as you can see it has this uh thing on here it's got this stuff on here and then it's even got this uh i guess they call it a dual pa so pick i don't know what that means but it's kind of embedded in the wood bridge right and so then a lot of people are going to say well that's going to mute the sound it's going to make the sound of your violin less but i don't feel like it does like I, or, or if it does, it's very negligible. Right. And just to be clear, like I have played this with orchestras acoustically as a soloist even before, right. you know, so. <laughs> you know, so I feel like I can get a decent sound. That's really good. <laughs> out of, out, I mean, out of this. And, but what do you think about that? Am I fooling myself? Is it like, no, it's really compromising the. No, so you know, like, y you know, in theory, when you put a boat in the ocean, it raises the tide, right? Just not enough to matter. Okay. So when we put a clamp on the side of the instrument, does it technically, does it technically reduce some vibrations? Man, maybe like that much, Yeah. not enough to matter. And most of the time, if you've got a permanently amplified violin, you're going to be playing amplified. So does it reduce the, the resonance of the violin a little bit? Maybe, who cares? Most of the time you're playing right. amplified and the audience isn't hearing the instrument, they're hearing what's coming out of the speakers. <clears throat> right, so uh, actually I just thought of this. So like two set violin, they've done a, a lot of you know vi uh, videos where they kind of roast America's Got Talent and some of these videos of electric violinists. And, um, and I think it's kind of this thing, I'm really interested in your take on this. I'm gonna share mine first mm. because I'm just, you know, you whatever. You might not be interested in my take. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we're gonna have a friendly debate about it, right? So so I mean, they, um, I, first of all, I love two set. My son loves two set. I mean, they, they do a lot of good. <laughs> I mean, okay, there's a good things about them, right? But, but this is interesting because I'm sensing from that something that I feel sometimes too, which is that people that are really promoting the love of classical music, they feel, this is what I think, Matt. I think that they feel like, hey, people aren't respecting classical music. Like, like two set, their whole thing is like, oh, an electric violinist can go on America's Got Talent and they can do like this and they add some distortion and they get a gazillion views. But like a classical violinist has been practicing their entire life and they go out to play this beautiful, you know, piece of, and nobody cares, right? So it's coming from this place of feeling neglected, not appreciated. Maybe they should try being interesting. <laughs> Boom! All right, so right. So, so I'm glad we're going into this. So, you know, and, and I've talked with Lori Niles about this, right? Who is the, uh, she was on the podcast. She's the uh, the owner of violinist.com mm -hmm. and she's a wonderful person, a violinist, a teacher, a journalist. Yeah, she's fantastic. Yeah, and she's, you know, and, and we kind of have this debate because I know you and I come from the same place where we're like, hey, classical music is too rigid. It's too exclusionary. It's too um, elitist, right? I, I, think I don't think the music is at all. I think right. the people around the music can be. Yeah, I love classical music and I play classical music yeah. on my electric violin. Right, but the culture can be, yeah. it, can, it can be very, uh, all these things, right? And so I think then we, people of our ilk, you know, are, can very much come get like defensive and resentment 
uh, resentful about it because it's like we've both been doing this for a long time playing rock music and felt like people were like oh that's not serious right or they didn't take us seriously but i think that people in classical music are coming from a similar place actually i think that like and because i asked laurie i was like why don't you promote more more stuff like a broader worldview of music education which is my whole mission i know it's yours too yeah. um and she was like i really want to promote classical music because I, you know, it needs more respect and this kind of thing. I was like, first of all, I was pissed off. But then I was like, wait a second. Actually, there's a good, there's a good intention behind that too, mm -hmm. right? I don't have to be mad at her. So anyway, two set was like, you know, these people that are doing these things on electric violins, they're cheating because they're not even playing a real violin because they're making a, um, because it doesn't take as much work to project, right? So I have a whole response to this, and I want to see, what do you think about it first? Uh, I think anybody who thinks the electric violin is easier to play than the acoustic violin doesn't play the electric violin. Uh -huh. uh, the electric violin is different from an acoustic violin. It's not easier or harder. There are things about it that are harder, and there are things about it that are easier. Um, no, I don't have to work very hard to get loud. But is that the point? Is the point that I can work really hard? I thought the point was to produce beautiful music. And by the way, about the America's Got Talent, wait till they find out that Brian King Joseph went to Berkeley and can probably play as well as they can. Sure. Uh, that's just not the thing that he's doing to make money. Yeah. So yeah. The, the elitist gatekeeping thing, I'm kind of over it. The viola joke thing, I'm kind of over it. The whole, you got to, this abusive, you must practice 40 hours a day mm. kind of thing. I'm kind of over it. A lot of people have had their psyches and their bodies ruined by that kind of mentality. I see. Promoting music and making people interested in practicing and playing and say, hey, in a rock and roll world, you know, Beethoven wrote some really, really good stuff and it's complex and it's interesting. Yeah. But you know what? So did the who. You know, the 20th century sure. happened. I know, I was there. Right, right. And that's, that's <laughs> I'm that old. Um, so the, I think, I, I don't want to say it's an either or. I think it's a both and. And that's where I think your best players are like you that can play classical music and can improvise, can play jazz, can play 21st century music. Uh, Rachel Barton Pine, I was just on the phone with her the other day, plays music from the 1500s and music from the 23rd century. She Hasn't plays, even been yeah, written she yet. Plays, she plays yeah. metal. She's famously like into really into metal right. and like, and all kinds of music actually. And she's, yeah, she's a, like amazing, amazing classical violinist. No question. Right. Um, so I think it's a both and. Both instruments are legit instruments. And that's why I'm getting my master's degree in electric violin. It is a separate, unique, different and legitimate instrument. Yeah. A lot like so Rudolph, my professor there, uses the analogy of we go from harpsichord to piano to pipe organ mm. to synthesizer, right? The keys are all laid out the same, different tools for different jobs. Yeah. The electric violin is sort of the pipe organ, where the acoustic violin is really more like the pianoforte. Mm -hmm. The pipe organ is louder, but can also be quieter. You can basically turn the blowers off and practice essentially silently. Yeah. You've got all these levers and things. You can change your tone. You change your sound. Mm. So there are, it's sort of the analogy between piano and organ. organ. Oh, you wow. wouldn't say, well, the, the organ is easier to play. Right. Blah, blah, blah. It's just different. Oh, yeah, that's that's a great analogy. I never thought about piano. It's it's actually perfect because, yeah, piano, you really have to work to project tone. On organ, it's easier to project tone. But I, I think my theory about that is that, um, you know, yeah, as, as a classical violinist, we do grow up sort of, you know... It's, it's all about, like, you know, lots of bow and big sound, which is, which is important sure. for many reasons. When we're playing an electric violin or when we're playing amplified, you know, I think that we, um, we don't have to work as hard to make tone, you know? You know, and this actually is one of the big technical changes I recommend to people when they're playing amplified. It's like, don't use so much, bro, because you don't need it. Why but, you wanna work that hard? Yeah, but then you get to work more on groove, you know, on and being- And subtlety. Yeah, subtlety. So, you know, so even if I have this loop with You know, even if I just want to do You 
know, so just to play like lines like this, um, I don't need much bow to do it. I can slur the bow more, and but it allows me to put more energy into creativity, sure. into the subtlety of groove, which is a different thing that, that frankly, the cats at two set, that's not a skill set they necessarily have, right? And I'm not dissing them. Like I said, I think there's a lot of great things about them, but I do think that they misspoke. I, I think that it was a mistake for them to, to say that electric violin is cheating. I get where they're coming from, where they're sort of roasting people that are trying to get like, cheap views and cheap accolades out there and and you know but i also think yeah come on guys like like let's come together you know so. yeah i think music should be an inclusive thing not an exclusive thing yeah we're, yeah. we're wanting to bring people in not keep people out yeah yeah um let's say so well i want to ask more about your master's degree in electric violin but first of all um a little more about gear just yeah a little bit so tone audit let's say somebody wants to well no, gear audit and tone audit. Let's say somebody wants to start um, putting together their gear, you know, getting the things they need. What's the easiest way for them to do it? Uh, I'm, I think you're going to say they should email you or call the shop, but maybe I'm wrong. No, yeah, I would say totally hit us up and, and we will do kind of what I talked about. The answer is what should I get? It depends. What do you want to do with it? And what are you doing with it right now? And what do you want to be doing with it in five years? What does your budget look like? How big of venues are you playing? What kind of groups are you playing with? How diverse are the performance settings that you're in? And because there's just, there is no one answer. There's not just one, hey, you should get this file on it. We should get a Yamaha, right? You should get- You should definitely get a Yamaha. <laughs> there are a lot of different Yamahas to choose from. Um, and for a lot of people, that's gonna be the right answer. Um, but there's not a universal answer on which amp should I get? Which effect should I get? Yeah, YEV is fantastic. Um, so, yeah, there, there's not a universal answer. And it's going to help if we can sort of talk through some of the options. You know, what are you playing for a thousand people every night? Are you playing with a different band every night? Are you doing weddings? Are you doing rock shows? Are you doing jazz? What are you doing? Um, you know, is your budget a thousand dollars? Is your budget ten thousand dollars? So, um, do you have to fly with this all the time? Right. Do you have roadies? Right. Just, you know, what's your situation? And we can help you. Yeah. And then understand that gear is modular. So you're going to, you're going to be able to add to and take away from this thing. I mm -hmm. don't use the same rig on every show. Right. So my rig depends on what do I need to do that night? Well, like, for example, if you're, if you're driving locally, you might have an amp that you carry to the gig. Right. But if you're, if you're traveling on a plane and playing in a big hall, you might just show up and play through the PA. Yeah. Actually, since you brought up the modular thing, I'd like to suggest, and, and tell me if I got this right or not, um, sort of like a four, like a four prongs. So, um, so as far as the first prong, I would say is, okay, it's, it's the instrument, uh, and I don't know the engineering terms, but you're either gonna have a mic, a pickup, or a solid body. Right, so that's the first thing to decide, mm -hmm. or a combination, which I have a combination, yep. right? Um, the second thing is, you're either gonna have an amp or go through a PA. Mm -hmm. The third thing is your effects, and the fourth thing is looping, if you do loop. Yep. That's how I think of it. Is that, do you think yeah. that's a so, helpful? Yeah, so I mean, if we think about the, we'll go back to the engineer. We're gonna go in, we're gonna follow that signal all the way through. So. We have to, wait, have to have a way to turn the sound that we're making with our body into electricity. Hmm. So that's either a mic <coughs> or a pickup, right? So it's either, and then that pickup is either going to be on an acoustic or a solid body instrument, or there are people who make sort of hybrid in between. Anyway, we have to turn that music into electricity. And then that electricity... Wait, so that, just to be clear, sorry, because I'm, I'm yeah. slow on this engineering stuff, and I appreciate this, though. This is great. So just to be clear, turning this down into electricity, you're either going to have a mic, a pickup, or a solid body, correct? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yep. Now, now, now next. And then it's going to go into a wire or a wireless, and it's going to, we have the ability to manipulate that signal if we want to. Maybe you just want it to, I want you to take the signal I got and make it loud, okay? Wait, 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 when you say signal... Sorry. So but... the electricity, <laughs> the signal that comes out of your instrument, once we turn that sound in electricity, we'll call that the signal. All right. And that's going to go through a wire, usually, 
uh, we can manipulate that. We can add reverb, we can add delay, we can add different effects, right? We can change the pitch of it. Right, like my octave? Yep. So what he's saying is that the instrument, this happens to be a solid body, there's a signal, I'm putting it into an effects pedal, and that's where I can put octave or wah right. wah or distortion or we whatever. We can manipulate that signal. Gotcha. And then maybe you're gonna go to a looper where you can loop that signal, right? Right. Yeah. Which means I'm gonna play something, it's gonna record X number of seconds of what I played, and then it's gonna just keep playing it back on a loop until I tell it to stop. <laughs> or it won't. So I, I told you that this, thing was complicated. I that know, thing man. kicked my butt, man. That's, that is hilarious. Wait a second. It's just easier oh. for me to hire a drummer. Yeah, wait, but I want to <laughs> save this anyway. Um, <laughs> so yeah, then so once pedal. it, we, we yeah. can, so we could, we got to see, we're going to generate a signal. We can manipulate that signal if we want. We can loop that signal if we want. And then it's got to get loud enough that people can hear it. So amplification, either you're going to carry an amp with you or you're going to plug into a sound system that's at a venue. It worked! Eureka! That's a loop pedal. So you've got your signal, which comes from either solid body, pickup, or microphone. Mm -hmm. Then you have the option if you want to go into some kind of effects, which mm -hmm. could be either bass, delay, you know, wah wah, distortion, etc. Then if you want, you can throw go through a looper or you can make loops or a laptop like you do to do your loops or whatever. And then you go either into an amp or a PA. Yeah. And those are all the kind of the different puzzles, the pieces of the module, the puzzle, you know, of the of the puzzle. So you just you, made my whole job sound so easy. <laughs> I mean it's I It's really not hard what we do here. I <laughs> always struggle when when I ask the questions and someone smart like you gives me the smart answer and i'm like no you lost me i don't want to hear about smart it's not working <laughs> i don't want to know what it really is i just want to know it in my own i just want to understand it for me so so this matt guy's not as smart as he wants you to think he is so we call this the gear audit. i'm gonna call this the gear audit and if you want to do a gear audit and you're like i need this or that or i'm not sure basically call Matt or call Electric Violin. I always yeah. say call Electric Violin Shop. Yeah. Their phone number is on their website. Do you know the phone number off the top of your head? No. Yeah, it's on. It's at, it's at electricviolinshop.com. There's a phone number. But literally, I'm sitting in their shop in North Carolina, and I think it's, their business hours are between 10 and 5 uh, U.S. Eastern. Yeah, 10 and 6. 10 and 6. And US I'm only Eastern. here two days a week. Uh, right. And if I'm on tour, I'm not here at all. So Chris, Susie, Eli, Jamie... Mm -hmm. Oh. There's Eli. Is that Eli right there? Yeah. That's Jamie. Oh, that's Jamie. Hi, Jamie. And that's Chris over there. They're literally right here. It's usually literally humans that they all own this place together. The employees own it. I can't believe how cool this place is. So, so yeah, anybody, and you call here, you're going to get a person on the phone who plays music. They play these instruments. They work on these instruments. It doesn't have to be me. But, you know, we all, we all talk about these things. We all have pretty similar opinions about these things. Anybody you call here is going to be able to answer your question. You don't have to be like, I want to talk to Eli, unless you really like Eli because Eli's cool. He is funny. He is funny. And Matt's cool, too. But they could probably, I'm guessing they could maybe email you or Duncan or something like that, too. But probably yeah. the best way to start is just call here. You will get a human. And it would be like, I don't know what I'm doing. What is, and then probably, what's, what, is, what is Chris going to say? What are you going to say if I go like, ah. I call and I'm like, uh, I'm thinking about getting the left. <laughs> <laughs> what, you call the right place. What are you going to say? What well, are you going to say, Chris? Like Matt said, uh, it, it pretty much starts with the, it depends. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to do? And they're like, oh, well, I just want to play in my worship band, uh, you know, on Sundays at the church. And, you know, I always sound too tinty. And then you'd be like, and then what are you going to say then? I will never, well, first of all, <laughs> I'll say that you're, that, 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 that you're praying worship. Your sound guy is going to love that you're electric. Yeah. So much easier for him to get your sound out to out, out to the congregation when he can just plug you into the board with everybody else. Because um, I had a, a, a lady a couple of years back who who was playing her cello with a microphone, and she's they 
they have a small um, stage and she was next to a trombone player. So she couldn't get heard. The first week she played with her electric, she called me on Monday and she said, the trombone player asked me to turn down. <laughs> <laughs> the power that's, that's the power get. that's the power yeah i love it when i'm on stage with a guitar player and they're like really loud and i'm like oh yeah Ugh, take that you know and then it's like it's like you get instant respect it's that's the, right that's right okay so that's the gear audit mm -hmm. that's how you solve the problem because little i get so many questions every week i'm like just call them because i mean i'll have the i'll have a conversation with you but i mean you know my time you know he's too busy being good at what he does <laughs> Um, but that's why we're making this video too, because you know I want to help you with these, and I get these questions. So now let's talk about the tone audit. Yeah, because this is something that you're doing. Yeah, Matt this is Bell. this is not an EVS thing. This is a Matt Bell thing. Um, yeah, I get this question all the time from people like, I hate my tone. I I want to get this tone that sounds like this, or you know, I listen to a recording of myself and I'm not happy with the way it sounds. I can come to you or you can come to me and we can spend a day or two days or 20 days, whatever customer can have, whatever they're willing to pay for. Um, so, and, and we can get your tone right. So yeah. that's a thing that I do. I've been doing this for- On Zoom? You can do it on Zoom? Yeah, no. Okay. No, it's so really gotta, gotta be you out in person and in context. We can, do, we can do some things on Zoom. We can do some things through recording. Um, gotcha. Just from from an engineering standpoint, yeah. Fletcher Munson curve, all that you guys can Google all that. Um, it, in person, in context is where the rubber meets the rim. Got you. And, okay. Uh, so yeah, that is the thing that but I. But you live in North Carolina. I live 15 minutes from an airport. But you okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. If you're serious about it, yeah. Um, and but you do travel a lot too, right? Uh, yeah. So this master's degree, you're doing this is virtual. Or are you going up to uh, Champaign? So Illinois I'm back or? and forth to Champaign quite a bit. Yep. Wow, this is the University of Illinois, right? Yes, University master's of degree. Illinois Urbana Champaign is the only, uh, as far as we know, it's the only university <laughs> on the planet that is offering bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees in electric violin. Chuck Von Traeger is going to be the first doctorate of electric violin. Oh my goodness. And tell me, it's Rudolph. Rudolph Hocken. Hocken. Is the professor. H-A-K-E-N. Look at some of his videos on mm -hmm. YouTube because it's it's incredible. Yeah. I mean, he's an in incredible composer. Mm -hmm. he, he wrote a concerto. He's written a couple of concertos. I mean, it's incredible. A, a great player. Um, he's just as good a pianist as he is a violinist. No way. Yeah, yeah. He accompanies himself. So he's, he's got a video studio in his house. Yeah, yeah. The guy is deep. Um, I mean, his music is deep. Mm -hmm. I mean, Rudolf Hocken, H-A-K-E-N. So that's who you're working with. And he's the kind of the, he's the person that's that's doing these mm -hmm. programs yep. at University of uh, Illinois. Yep. That's cool. So you're going up there um, back and forth to do your master's. Mm -hmm. That is so heavy, man. Yeah, man. Serious. Wow. How, um, and because you can't really do it all remote. Is that why? Or you just want to be there it's, in person? Um, so you're a dad and you've got yeah, a job right? and all this other stuff too, yeah. Yeah, and a frequent flyer. <laughs> so, uh, no, I mean, music, we do what we can remotely, right. but there are certain things that cannot be done remotely. It's like it's it. really hard to put on a uh, an ensemble performance remotely, right? We could hold up a yeah. cell phone and hope yeah. for the best, but... Um, no, there's 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 things that I need to be on campus for, so I go to campus for those things. I love your commitment, man. I love that. That's you know that's what's up. And and thank you by the way for playing my. Uh, I, I just have to make a plug too. I mean, you played one of my pieces on one of your uh, recitals with the electric violin. Uh, it's called Postlude, and if if you don't have it, you can get it free at my website christianhouse.com. You can uh, just join the newsletter, and I'll send you a free copy. Of the trying caprice. to get you paid, man. It's uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I'll I'll sell it to you if you want, you know. But you can you can't get it. No, free. the performances. If you perform that, oh, you oh, gotta got send you. him send him the program. Oh, yeah, we gotta get the you. man paid. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the United States, if someone plays your your original composition, I think it's very minuscule. They do a better job of that in Europe, from what I understand. But but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe yeah, at least changed. buy it. Cup of coffee, right? Maybe I don't know. My my <laughs> coffee's expensive. I get a quad shot of espresso, and I like the single origin, so it's usually five bucks. But um, that's amazing, though, that you're doing that. The master's degree, and and you are a dad of a 15 year old boy. I got a 15 year old son, and 11 year old daughter, and a, okay, yeah, and two dogs. And but for many years, you were gigging mm -hmm. uh, with a band, doing corporate things, festivals, clubs, uh, weddings. Um, 
So I know you've learned a ton about being a functional musician, a working yeah. musician. I don't know about functional, but I was a working musician. And, and when I say functional, I mean like the difference between being a classical musician, right. although classical musicians are functional in the classical world, but you have had to learn how to be an, an improviser and like work with different uh, situations, yeah, be able to, sure. you know, do all these other skills that we talk about that are missing from, from our classical education. Um, so I know that you kind of, what's the word? You cut your... What did they say? Cut your cloth, or something? I can't remember. But you, 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 you paid your dues. Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. years. Yeah, twenty yeah. years I toured with bands. I ten years in Texas and ten years in North Carolina was touring with party bands, basically. Yeah. And why did you stop doing that? I felt like I had sort of said everything I had to say in that creative space. Yeah. Yeah, it was time. Yeah. And my kids were getting to the age where they were old enough to be fun to do stuff with, but young enough that they wanted to do that stuff with me. Um, and financially, I was in a place where I was able to not be out 150 to 200 nights a year. Wow. Um, yeah. I, and But the bigger part, the biggest part was creatively, I had said what I needed to say in that space. No. Yeah. You know, a lot of the stuff we're playing, it's party tunes, stuff that you're going to hear at weddings and corporate events there aren't violin parts in any of this, right? There aren't string parts in a boy band medley. There's not string parts in Jesse's Girl. There's not string parts in, in Michael Jackson stuff, mostly. You know, Quincy Jones orchestrated a lot of that. But So when you stand on stage in a rock band that doesn't have a piano player and you're playing stuff that was very heavily synth-based music, you've got to write your part. Yeah. So most of what I played every night was stuff that I had written I didn't write that song, but I wrote the part that I was going to play. I had to listen to it and decide, okay, here's the hole that needs to be plugged, and here's how I'm going to plug it with a violin and with effects. And I was doing live looping with a band and then singing and all that stuff. So I, there was a lot of creativity involved in playing Jesse's Girl, believe it or not. Um, that you get, and some of it is stuff that you're going to write those parts, and some of it are game time decisions every night. There's a lot of improv. I may decide to plug that hole differently tonight than I did the night before. And we're listening to each other. It's it's very much a collaborative thing. Um, but you know, you do that a few thousand times. You kind of yeah. at some point you're like, okay, I'm ready for the next thing. But and you're really going big for that next thing. I mean, a master's degree in electric violin, and you're taking on a lot of artistic, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Uh, New, you know, new challenges. Well, I wrote know, and released two albums in, in two years. Right. Yep. Right. Yeah. It's amazing stuff too. Uh, where can people find those albums and that's on a, you know, some of your. Yeah. You can buy them on my website, mattbellviolinist.com. Uh, and if you're a streamer, you can find them on all the streaming, on all of the streaming places. Uh, you know, you can go to the ones that they actually pay the creators or you can go to Spotify. And just look Matt Bell Violinist. Yeah. Dot com. Okay. That's good. So, um, Man, we covered a lot of territory. I feel like this was really good. Uh, I just want to say thank you uh, for being my friend. Yeah, and, man. And you're an inspiration, man. You're a smart guy. Well, I try to pretend anyway. <laughs> no, it's beautiful. Um, so, mattbellviolinist.com uh, for tone audits. Check out his original music. And also just be in touch with him on socials because, Matt, he really does answer probably more. He answers more questions than I do. You're really engaged on social media. And you're helping Electric Violin Shop help tons of people through your TikTok, through Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. You guys are there for everybody. So um, thanks to Electric Violin Shop for uh, sponsoring Creative Strings Podcast. And thanks to Yamaha for sponsoring uh, Creative Strings Podcast. Uh, creative string players depend on Yamaha. You can also go to uh, uh, find Yamaha Educator Suite. You can find that online. You can look for the Yamaha Educators Facebook group, which is a free race resource for educators. And uh, you can also learn about all the different Yamaha electrics, cello, violin, etc. Anyway, make everything. Yeah. the instruments, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, they own Line 6. So a lot of the wireless and effects stuff, I use yeah. Line 6 wireless and effects stuff. They make amplifiers. They make uh, jet skis, so if uh, <laughs> lawnmowers. And, and they support educators. They, they support music education. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, Matt. Appreciate you. Yeah, man. Good times. Yeah.